Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Sex Addiction in the News on Facebook Live, Fridays at 5. I'm Stacy Sprout, licensed psychotherapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and author of my own story of healing, Naked in Public, a memoir of recovery from sex addiction and other temporary insanities. Thank you for joining me for this evening's broadcast or webcast. And this was created to be educational. Uh, and I did it because I'm passionate about destigmatizing the conversation about sex addiction. So those who are afflicted, whether it's an individual, couples, families, and communities can get help now. So uh, I'll be checking the live feed at the end of the show for questions or comments. So if you have any, I'll try my best to respond. And I'm excited to say I got three stories sent to me this week by viewers. And one of them just came in minutes ago. It's so new, I don't even have a slide for it. So I'm calling it my breaking news. So without further ado, let's hear what the world is saying about sex addiction. The first story is related peripherally to sex addiction, and it is that 24 hours after the United States Congress passed a landmark piece of legislation to combat online sex trafficking, with a near unanimous bipartisan support, the most significant legislative action in decades, major prostitution websites, including, well, or pages on sites that are used to facilitate prostitution are going dark. This includes Craigslist, uh, Personals, City Vibe, Erotic Review, and pages on Reddit used to trade sex. Why exactly are these major sites changing their policies or did they change their policies overnight? because this week the Senate passed H.R. 1865, the FOSTA-SESTA legislation that allows victims of online sex trafficking to hold the websites that knowingly facilitated their abuse accountable. Money talks, folks, and this is a major victory for advocates that have hung in there with a long and hard-fought legislative battle. Especially congratulations to the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, World Without Exploitation, the organization called I Am Jane Doe, and many others who pushed hard for Congress to act. This effort took, took years and heated up considerably in the last several months. This is a victory that will prevent more acting out in sex addiction and prevent more victim, victimization in the sex trade. Good news. So back to the regular scheduled plan broadcast. Thanks for us for that piece of news. Our headline news tonight is a story from Omaha, Nebraska, a video from KETV Investigates, and it's titled, Porn and Sex Addiction, Signs You May Have a Problem. I'm not gonna show you the video tonight because I asked them for permission to show it and the licensing fee was $1,000. So since I don't have a budget for the show, I am just gonna uh, read to you some key excerpts, but it's a fantastic story. And any therapists who happen to be watching or coaches or anyone who works in the sex addiction field, this is a great tool, I think, to educate clients who are just coming into awareness about what sex or porn addiction might look like, uh, especially for men. So some key excerpts from the story. And these were told to investigator from the KETV investigate show named Julie Cornell. And she writes, his private world was exposed in the fall of 2017 when an Omaha man's wife discovered his infidelity, stemming from a lifelong struggle with pornography and sex addiction. Ryan is middle-aged, highly educated, and has children. When his story unraveled, he revealed he'd been seeing prostitutes regularly, up to twice a week, to feed his sex addiction after years of online porn use. Another man was just 11 years old when he became hooked on internet porn because he was curious. 13 years later, Josh told me, investigator uh, Julie, uh, Julie Cornell, that it's still a daily struggle not to seek out pornography. Quote, for a long time, Josh says, it's like all I wanted to focus on was when am I going to get my next fix? He said, it, he said when he thinks about how much time he's wasted, it makes him sick. According to certified sex addiction therapist Connie Lofgreen, who works with clients at her West Omaha office, quote, 
This addiction cuts across every social class, males and females, all ages. I've worked with porn addicts as young as eight who accidentally found porn when they were just looking for games online, she says. Ryan, like so many men, says he first found comfort viewing online pornography, but he said in order to create the same comforting effect, the addiction ramped up to meeting with women in person to try to find the intimacy he felt he was missing in his life. Experts say sex addiction and porn addiction stimulate the pleasure center of the brain, creating feel-good dopamine brain chemicals. But like all addictions, a person needs more intense exposure over time. Lofgren says the hypersexual images people can view online flood the, way, the brain in ways nature never intended. She said the brain is virtually hijacked to seek pleasure, much like the way cocaine affects the brain. It progresses, she said. She says the person needs more intensity to get the same result. So they tend to move toward edgier and edgier things. Addicts normalize their behavior. It's called denial. After much counseling, Ryan believes that drive toward porn and years of hookups stemmed from the lack of intimacy he experienced as a child, along with misguided thinking. Josh, who's now 27, believes overeating and video gaming might also be part of his addictive personality. He hasn't seen a therapist about the porn issue and is trying to handle it on his own and with his support group. I'll tell them this week I've done reasonably well, he said proudly. Lofgreen said, it helps when they realize this is a medical disorder. This is a medical problem that needs treatment. They're not bad. They're not crazy. They're ill. According to Ryan, Quote, before, my thoughts were that I viewed women as a commodity. Now, a year into his treatment, he constantly connects with his feelings and whether he has positive or negative thoughts. Lofgreen encourages people to seek help even if they, they oh, Lofgreen encourages people to seek help if they even think they have a problem. Not everyone who views porn is addicted, she says. So how do you know? Well, here are 10 signs that might indicate a problem with pornography. One, do you keep secrets from your spouse about your online life? Two, are you preoccupied with seeking out sexual images? Three, do you find yourself isolating and spending many hours online? Four, do you find yourself being irritable, anxious, or having trouble sleeping or craving porn when you don't have access. Five, are you lying about online behaviors and the amount of time you spend looking at porn? Six, do you use porn regularly to escape, relieve stress, or reward yourself? Seven, are you taking time from work? Oops, I forgot my, <laughs> sorry. Seven, are you taking time away from work family, friendships, healthful activities to spend time viewing porn online. Eight, have others been hurt because of your online porn use? Nine, have you noticed your porn use has progressed to edgier genres? And 10, are you having erectile dysfunction which may be related to porn use? So those 10 are for people who are married or males, but it could also be in a committed partnership. And for females, the question of, are you having any sexual dysfunction related to your porn use? And that might be an exaggerated sexual hypersexuality, or it also might be a decreased sexual desire related to porn use. Lofgreen encourages couples and individuals to seek out information on porn and sex addiction. She has actually written a book called The Storm of Sex Addiction which is our sex addiction book of the week this week. So I'll be sharing more about it later in the show. Thank you, Connie, and thank you, KETV Investigates in Omaha for this great coverage on sex and porn addiction to help people better understand the problem and get help for the solution. Oops. 
This story on partners and families in sex addiction was sent by Paul from Southern Ontario, Canada. A great example of how we can do more together than we can do alone by helping to share stories about what's out there. So thank you, Paul, for helping me spread this story of hope. When Rebecca Cruz confronted her husband, actor Terry Cruz, about his sex addiction, he says it woke him up. Rebecca and Terry Cruz appeared on the Dr. Phil show on March 14, 2018, to talk about his betrayal of her with pornography and using prostitution. Her confrontation of him, getting help, and how she's doing now, excuse me, several years later. Rebecca Cruz says, the hardest part was knowing that someone I loved, respected, and trusted was nothing like what I thought he was. And now it was like a lie. Everything was a lie. When he saw I meant business, it really challenged him. He said he made the commitment to get better whether or not he got us back. Rebecca says he suddenly became very transparent. It really was not like him in my mind. He put the money where his mouth was and he went to see a counselor. Afterward, she says, it, I think it took me probably three years to trust him again. I have little moments now of PTSD. About his wife, Terry Cruz says, Rebecca Cruz is my backbone. When someone knows you from good all the way to the rottenest, dirty parts of yourself, dirtiest parts of you and loves you anyway, that's the rarity. That's where you want to be. You can see more on this story if you look up Dr. Phil's show and, and Terry and Rebecca Cruz, but I will post a link when I post this show on my YouTube channel. And my comments about this show, you know, one of the things that Terry says is, he says, I was a card-carrying member of this toxic masculinity. And now he's part of that group of empowered, awake, aware men in sexual recovery that I spoke about on the show last week when I was talking about Horst Benedict and Andrew Bauman. You can see more about Terry's story of addiction and healing in his YouTube series that he calls Dirty Little Secret. And, you know, I think that a, a key reason that their marriage worked out and Rebecca chose to stay with him is because he was serious and he got into recovery and he worked very hard. So congratulations to the Cruz family for your healing and your willingness to go public with your sex addiction recovery story to help other families heal too. Our opinion on sex addiction feature comes to us from The Spectator, a weekly British magazine on politics, culture, and current affairs. This article is titled, Blue Pill Pushers, Why is Viagra Being Marketed to Young Men? It's about how Britain will soon become the first country in the world where Viagra can be bought without prescription. And the author of the story is Lara Prendergast. Here are some key excerpts from the article. Later this year, pharmacies will start selling something called Viagra Connect, an over-the-counter version of the drug that doesn't require a prescription. Picking up a packet of Viagra will soon be as easy as buying a bottle of Night Nurse. As an American, I don't know what Night Nurse is, but apparently it's easy to buy. This will make Britain the first country in the world where Viagra can be bought without prescription. The aim, according to Pfizer, the drug company that sells it, is to help men get a hold of the drug more easily without the embarrassment of having to go to the doctor to ask for it. Male embarrassment may explain the enormous black market for the drug in Britain. In the past five years, 49.4 million pounds worth of counterfeit Viagra has been seized. Impotence drugs now account for 90% of all captured counterfeit pills. A comparable story is playing out across the Atlantic. In a single week in 2016, Canadian police seized 2.5 million worth of counterfeit pharmaceuticals at the border, 98% of which were for sexual enhancement. In December, the first generic version of the drug appeared in the U.S., and Silicon Valley types sniffed an opportunity to profit. Zachariah Reitano, a 26-year-old entrepreneur, recently launched 
Roman, a men's health cloud pharmacy. The app aims to provide a seamless and affordable way for men to get a hold of Viagra cheaper, oh, Viagra or cheaper legal versions. Roman's target customers are 25 to 45 year old men. Which brings us back to the question, why are young men taking Viagra or feeling under pressure to do so? The simple explanation would be that they are taking it recreationally in order to perpetuate their hedonistic lifestyles. Viagra means that men can be intoxicated with all sorts of other substances, legal and illegal, and still perform sexually. But the paradox is that younger men are known to be more abstemious than their predecessors, more addicted to their smartphones than to hard drugs. What is more likely is that smartphones are part of the problem. A generation of men have grown up with easy access to pornography. Compared with the exotic appeal of the internet, normal sex seems vanilla. Pornography addiction is a modern malady and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that men are seeking treatment because of it. One US study published last year showed that men who regularly watch porn were more likely to suffer from impotence. In 2011, an Italian study came up with the term sexual anorexia to describe the divorce of sexual desire from real life. Viagra, says author Prendergast, just offers a temporary escape from impotence. My comments about this story. I first learned the term sexual anorexia from the same book published in 1997 by psychologist Patrick Carnes, with whom I trained to earn my certification as a sex addiction therapist. According to Google and Wikipedia, the term has earlier roots than that. But I think it's interesting to consider that sexual anorexia can be induced by sexual overstimulation from overconsumption of pornography or other forms of sexual stimulation. I also, I also think it's upsetting to think about a drug corporation deliberately targeting young men and profiting from their erectile dysfunction. And it appears to be working. According to a 2016 study reported in the U.S. National Library of Medicine, they looked at 16 to 21 year old males over two years and they found that over several checkpoints during the two year period, these young men reported low sexual satisfaction at 48%, low sexual desire at 46%, and problems in erectile function at 45%. Researchers wrote that clinical reports suggest that terminating internet pornography use is sometimes sufficient to reverse these negative effects. And again, I will attach links to the articles on YouTube so you can read for yourself. In our LGBTQ and sex addiction feature, we have a story, What is Gay Affirming Sexual Addiction Therapy? written by Michael J. Salas, CSAT, certified sex therapist, and owner of Vantage Point Counseling Services in Dallas, Texas. Gay affirming, gay affirming therapy is meeting gay clients where they are, this is an excerpt from the article, in their journeys of self-acceptance while providing them a safe container to travel this journey. It also includes validating their emotional and personal stories and experiences. Gay men contend with regular and serious levels of shame. Those who are affirming of gay men recognize and accept their own biases surrounding sexual orientation. Many therapists will describe themselves as being gay friendly, which means that they will accept a gay client. However, this doesn't mean that they have personal awareness of their own biases, nor do they focus on client comfort. When therapists are unaware of these biases, they are at greater risk of shaming clients, sometimes without even knowing that they have done so. Gay men are much more likely to come into treatment for sex addiction, for problems with compulsive cheating, than any other sexual behavior. Therapists should work with these clients to help them reach their own therapeutic goals. This would be to help them gain an understanding of their compulsive behavior so that they can live in congruence with their relationship value system. This can help them connect with their partners 
and have the kinds of relationships that they want to have. So to summarize, the answer to what is gay affirming sexual addiction therapy, there are three key points. One, the therapist has awareness about their own biases about sexual orientation. Two, the therapist follows the goals of the client, not the therapist goals for the client. And three, the therapist helps create a safe, non-shaming and curious tone. I hope we continue to hear more from Michael Salas about gay affirming therapy of all kinds, but especially sexual addiction therapy. In sex addiction research, we have the development and validation of the Bergen-Yale sex addiction scale with a large national sample. That's 23,533 Norwegian adults. The survey took place collaboratively between the University of Bergen, Norway, Nottingham Trent University in the UK, and the Yale School of Medicine at Yale University in the United States. Using a cross-sectional anonymous survey, the Bergen-Yale Sex Addict Scale was administered to a broad national sample, as I said, of 23,533 Norwegian adults aged 16 to 88 years old. Average age was 35.8. The majority of the participants, 41%, were between 16 and 30 years old, and 15,299 who took the survey were women, or 65%. 8,234 were men, or 35%. This new method for assessing sex addiction is based on established addiction components, for example, craving, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict problems, and loss of control, together with validated measures of personality traits, narcissism, self-esteem, and a measure of sexual addictive behavior. High scores on the BYSAS were more prevalent among those who were men, single, younger age, and with higher education. Interestingly, men with PhDs scored higher for sex addiction than men with less education. The sex addict profile emerged of a man who is neurotic, extroverted, intelligent, imaginative, though not agreeable nor conscientious. Researchers concluded that the BYSAS is a brief, psychometrically reliable, and valid measure for assessing sex addiction. My comment is that it is an amazing look at addiction in Norway focusing on sex and masturbation with an incredibly large sample size. And congratulations to the researchers behind this extraordinary effort. Can you imagine all the work involved at tallying all of those scores? I mean, they probably had computers, but still. Uh, however, until we begin to broaden the scope of questions on surveys to include relationship addiction measures to get at love addiction symptoms, we will continue to have results that despite more women taking the, the survey, demonstrate a bias toward men. I will talk more about research on women's sexuality and sex and love addiction on the show next week. Our next story comes to us from the Los Angeles Times, who we featured last week as well. They're doing some great uh, coverage of sex addiction. And I'm calling this 12-step sexual recovery in the news. Uh, and it involves a story called Don't Laugh It Off, Sex Addiction Recovery Could Help Resolve the Harassment Crisis. And I love this story by Virginia Heffernan. It was published on March 17, 2018. And here are some key excerpts. On Monday, James Levine, the longtime music director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York, was fired after the Met investigated his history of sexual abuse of young men, including teenagers. Levine sued the Met for $5.8 million for breach of contract and defamation. On Tuesday, a report surfaced that five women had accused the architect, Richard Meyer, of groping, exhibitionism, assault, and paying for silence. While our, and this is a quote by Meyer, he said in a statement, while our recollections may differ, I sincerely apologize to anyone who was offended by my behavior. The author writes, anyone who was offended. 
In the months since the seismic expose of Harvey Weinstein, more than 120 high profile men have been publicly accused of sexual misconduct, often with serious consequences. When they first get the news, many toss it off or rage, lawyer up and sue. One thing they don't do, lately anyway, is to admit a psychosexual problem. Hefferman asserts that no one has a handbook for, a set for handling sexual misconduct, but then she goes on to write, yet one does exist, a program of recovery that is less scientific than moral reckoning, less luxury clinic and more church cellar. The program uses the word addict, but not in a 2018 sense. No brain science nor science at all is integral to the treatment. Instead, it's a spiritual program in which perpetrators confront their selfishness and cultivate ruthless honesty. They also create a searching inventory of what might be called sin and make amends to those they have harmed. This is Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, which was founded in Boston in 1976 by a recovering alcoholic. He thought that the 12 steps that had helped him overcome alcoholism could also help him stop compulsive philandering. SLAA often serves as a punchline and its meetings can easily be imagined as a pickup joint for the promiscuous. They're anything but that. Recovery in SLAA is not sexy. There's prayer, service to others, and chores like floor mopping that might be just the thing for a vain maestro or arrogant architect. SLAA sometimes goes by a more dignified and evocative name, the Augustine Fellowship. St. Augustine of Hippo is rarely invoked in the context of Me Too, but maybe he ought to be. He was a man of restless sexual energy who in his famous Confessions copped to harming people for his sexual gratification. The story of Augustine's redemption, a dividend of his own moral commitments as well as God's grace, is foundational to Protestantism. Protestant. <laughs> I get nervous and it's hard for me to pronounce things. Protestant. Prod. Okay, I know how to say that word, but I'm just going to go on, sorry. Those in the Augustine Fellowship hardly let themselves off the hook for the sexual harms they've committed. Everything from harassment to infidelity to wanton consumption of pornography goes on their inventories. Whether or not they believe in God, they commit to the 12 steps not to repair their reputations, but to save their souls. Several men I respect, the author writes, have stopped compulsive and cruel sexual behavior in the Augustine Fellowship. Their recoveries are both arduous and admirable. For one of them, the strict policing of what the Fellowship calls, quote, people, places, and things, triggers, has continued for years. He avoids all pornography, red light districts, and even roads with strip clubs on them, along them. His amends to the women he harmed have included taking full, undefensive responsibility for all the suffering he caused. No, our recollections may differ here. Such forthrightness requires humility. The Augustine Fellowship exists for abusers and others who can find humility in their humiliations. I thought that was a beautiful story and summary by Virginia Heffernan. And it's just great to see coverage in the mainstream news. Our sex addiction book of the week is The Storm of Sex Addiction, Rescue and Recovery by Connie A. Lofgreen. This is the book I was talking about earlier. The book description re reads, from one of the country's most insightful therapists comes an unprecedented examination of this burgeoning illness. In the storm of sex addiction, Connie Lofgreen skillfully educates 
bringing clarity to concepts with helpful explanations and stories. She explains the dynamics and roots of the disorder and provides practical information and compassionate guidance to anyone affected. She describes the components necessary for predictable recovery and envisions a new era, era of valuing authentic, intimate relationships or reckless sexual consumption and exploitation. Lofgreen makes a clarion call for awareness of sex addiction as a public health issue and presents strategic initiatives to respond. The Storm of Sex Addiction is an informative and useful resource, a must-have for people who want to understand the illness, its treatment, and prevention. And this is one of the great entry books for anybody who is new to the concept of sex addiction. Anyone who signs up on my newsletter automatically gets an email with a list of some, some books that are just great to start out with, and this is on there. So thank you, Connie, for this great resource. Sex Addiction in the News Show is always seeking stories uh, about sex addiction, love addiction, and hope for recovery in the public media to feature on our show. If you see a story you think might be appropriate, you can message it to me on Facebook or send it to me via email at naked, to nakedinpublicnews at gmail.com. Together, we can get the word out about what the world is saying about sex addiction. Before we close tonight, I am going to take a look at the live feed to see if there's any questions or comments. I'm not intending to give therapeutic advice, but if I can help with suggestion or idea, please feel free to ask. I may need to research the answer and get back to your question next week. Oh, how fun. <laughs> Hi, friends. I'm seeing some lovely people who have watched the show. Hi, Heidi. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks for Lacey Bentley. Yes, women do measure differently. Yeah, and I am going to talk about that more next week. Hi. <laughs> Facebook's great. I see these little thumbs. <laughs> oh, thank you, DJ. <laughs> Well, I am seeing lovely comments from lovely people, and thank you so much. And I'm not seeing questions at this point, so I think there is a tiny bit of delay from when I speak to when it actually goes on, but um, so maybe next week we'll get some questions, but thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's, it makes, uh, makes it really fun, and it makes it, it's just exciting to be a part of sharing these, this great news. So. <laughs> uh, um, so, okay, that is all our news, and thank you so much for joining me for this week's show. I'll be back next Friday on Facebook Live at 5 p.m. Pacific at my author page for another episode, and I hope you can join me there. You can catch my previous episodes on YouTube. Uh, Stacy Sprout under Sex Addiction in the News, and you can subscribe and hit the little bell to receive notifications when new shows are posted. Until next time, I leave you with this. May you feel loved, may you feel cherished, and may you love and cherish others. I'm Stacy Sprout signing off from Sex Addiction in the News. Mahalo and have a wonderful weekend. Bye. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Thank you.